Well, the, the first half dozen shows that were on the air were, the, were, 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 were how we started. Aunt, Aunt B coming to live with, with Opie and me. In the pilot, there was only, uh, it, was Danny, it was on Danny's show, it was a spinoff. Uh, Francis Bavier and Ronnie Howard and me were the only regulars. Dan, Don Knotts saw that on the air, the pilot on the air, and called me down here. And I said, I didn't know you, you, were, that you were out of, the, out of work. He says, yes, Steve was canceled. I said, call Sheldon. And that, that's, what made, that's what made the show a hit. Was was Don, because originally that's what I didn't like about the show. They had me as sheriff, justice of the peace, editor of the paper, and I'd tell little funny stories about people around town. That would have lasted maybe two weeks. Yeah, I didn't like that about the concept. I remember the first day. Sheldon was a very uh, bright, astute man. Uh, the first day they shot with three cameras. And the first day was always spent on the script. So that day, I didn't have much to say at all. Artie Stander, Danny Thomas, and Sheldon Leonard yelled at one another all day. And I asked Sheldon if I could talk to him at the end of the day, and he walked me to the gate. I said, if this is what television is, I don't think I can handle it. He said, Andy, the, the star dictates what the attitude will be on the set. He said, Danny likes to yell, so we all yell. If you don't want to yell, nobody will yell. That's the way it was. Danny Thomas was driving from Florida to north, up north. And he went through Mayberry, which was, uh, I, I was on patrol, and he called it a speed trap. And I wanted to find him, and he didn't want to pay the fine, so he went to jail. And they had all television cameras and stuff in there. And I forget how it wound up that Andy was right and Danny was wrong and Danny admitted it. And uh, so that was the pilot. When John, Don joined the company, the second episode was called Manhunt. And I knew by that episode, I knew that Don should be the comic and I should play straight for him. And that made all the difference. All the difference. Then Mayberry became... A, a living town. We had all the comic characters that came on. I played straight for them. So Mayberry really was the star of the show. Sh Sheldon actually said one time, I think we misnamed this show. Should have been called Mayberry to start with. But Don, Don, the event of Don on this show changed the whole groundwork of it. Because every comic character came on, we added them as fast as they, we could find them. And I was straight to all of them, and I love being a straight man. During the last season of the Steve Allen Show, uh, Pat Harrington Jr., uh, uh, he and his wife liked to play bridge, and so did we. So we were playing bridge with him one night, and he said, I want to watch, he said, let's stop and I'll watch the... Danny Thomas show, because he they were thinking about using Pat on on the show. It turned out they were doing <coughs> a pilot of the Andy Griffith show that night. Now I didn't even know it. Andy it was still back in New York, I, so I hadn't seen him in a long time. He was doing a, a musical on Broadway. So when I saw this, it, it was a, of the sheriff in a small town. And I said, oh, gee, you know, he could use a deputy. So I called, I called him in New York, and he said, that's a hell of an idea. So he said, I'm, I'll call Sheldon Leonard. He's going to be our exec producer. He said, why don't you go see him and sit with him? And uh, so that's how it, I, I went in and talked to Sheldon. We kicked it around for a while, and I waited several weeks and finally got the call to come in and, do the show. I didn't create the character in the beginning. The writers wrote wrote it, you know, wrote him in. But we, like all running parts in TV, uh, 
you know, each week you'd add something or then they'd add something and the character just built as we went. Andy um, is a very intelligent guy, um, sort of self-schooled. You know, he was a teacher who kind of taught himself to be an entertainer. And, you know, he, I don't know if he ever studied acting anywhere or not, but he really built his own sense, his own aesthetic, you know, and it just kind of came from a place of logic for him. And, and, but he was an entertainer first. You know, he was a monologist and he was a singer and he, and he never was really a stand-up comedian per se, but he was a humorist, kind of in the Will Rogers vein. And uh, that's what he did first and foremost. And, you know, to this day, if you get him up in front of an audience, he's pretty entertaining, he knows how to do it. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, he's, and he's ambitious about it, you know, he, he, wants, he wants to entertain. He could be very, very serious. The show was important to him. He poured everything he had into it. And, and uh, he was the, really the rock that, on which the show was built in every way. And um, he was the one that established the tone of that set, which was playful um, when, you could, when, when it was appropriate to be having fun. But when the time came to, to make the show, to do the shot, to get the joke, that was pretty serious. And um, I've, I've always felt that that's another thing that I really took away from the show, was a sense that, hey, it was, you know, it could be a lot of fun, but uh, we have a responsibility to what we're doing here. And, and um, it, you know, it's, it is something to, um, it's an opportunity not to be wasted. And, and, and so, so Andy was a real great natural leader, even though he wasn't formally a producer on the show, and formerly a writer. He was a tremendous contributor and, and, um, and, and often was a kind of an arbiter of, you know, what was right and wrong with the scene. I was called in to the office to meet with the producers and um, uh, went home that afternoon and found out that I had the part. And I didn't read or anything. I didn't really know that much about it, except that I was going to be in the show. Uh, with Andy Griffith, and that I was going to be playing a lady druggist, and uh, so I was the. I had taken over the drugstore from my uncle, who had retired, uh, and um, it was sort of a loose premise to get to get a female in town, I guess, of Andy's age, and uh, it didn't it didn't really work out. I um, I did eleven episodes, and uh, just there for the first season. I had a three-year contract and when it was, when we'd taken the break for the hiatus, I, uh, I asked to be let out of the contract because I didn't feel that I was doing my best, it was not my best work and I was going through some personal problems at the time and I needed some time. I had gone directly from Father Knows Best into the Calling Miss Peters to having maybe a couple of months of turmoil in my personal life that was not settled at all and was an ongoing whirlwind and then went right into the show. I was exhausted and I just needed, needed a break. And, uh, so they, they accepted my, uh, my uh, leave taking from the show, which kind of hurt my feelings. <laughs> I had hoped they'd say, oh, please. <laughs> But they didn't. <laughs> Would you have stayed if they had? Probably. Probably. I needed, um, I badly, badly needed at that period uh, someone to want me, somebody to like me a lot. And I really, really wanted to be wanted. Um, and so it was, uh, it was a tough, it was a tough time. Up in Barney's room. Uh, I was, we used a landlady that I had in New York on 14th Street and uh, 
you could only use little tiny 40 watt bulbs. I would go out once in a while and buy a 100 watt bulb, and she'd come in without even being announced and take that bulb and smash it. She'd say, Edison is rich enough already, you know. And uh, there were some actors living on the top floor cooking on a hot plate, which was forbidden. And one night, she was, they heard her coming up the stairs while they were making dinner, and they took the hot plate and shoved it into the bureau drawer and closed the drawer, and the whole place caught fire. We just used that on the, up in Barney's room on the Griffith Show. You didn't or did? Did, did. did. Oh, it was a very good show. A friend of mine was uh, uh, working his way through medical school, and uh, he was working in a gas station, and a, a guy came in in a, a Packard Phaeton, beautiful car, and he was supposed to pump grease into the steering column from below, and he couldn't get any grease to go in. He said to the manager, the grease won't go in, and the guy said, just force it, put the pressure up as high as you can and force it for 10 minutes. So he did. Now this guy comes in a white suit, picks up his car, and just as it goes over the curb to leave, uh, a snake of grease came out of the steering column, and the horn button stayed right on top of it, and it went out, and it stood there, and then flopped over on his white, white suit. And we did that in uh, Barney's car. How Barney, did you use that? Barney's first car. A lot of things, a lot of things. Uh, we had Barney's motorcycle. I, I bought a motorcycle for $4, a World War I motorcycle. And uh, I put it together and got it, got it working. And, and, and uh, we used that motorcycle for Barney's motorcycle. And hid some historical documents, fake historical documents, in, about its record in World War I. Yeah, we shot with one camera. That was, that was Sheldon's, Sheldon's choice, and it was fortunately my choice, too. I love to work with one camera. And uh, we, we, we worked on the script one full day, Thursday. Every, every actor had an opportunity to take a shot at it. Friday, and then uh, Friday we rehearsed, and we shot Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Sheldon would come down. We read two scripts on Thursday, one to be shot a week away and one to be shot that following Monday. And Sheldon, we'd read the script, and Sheldon would give his notes on it, and he would leave. And that's what was so appealing about Sheldon. He'd give his notes on it and leave, and we would either accept what he had to say or not, and nothing was ever said about it. Sheldon never mentioned it. We'd either take his idea or not. We worked on a script on Thursday. Read one script, worked on another script. We'd work on, work on the one that was going to be shot on Monday. Then we'd come in and read it again on Friday morning and make some final notes on it, and then we'd rehearse it. If anything didn't work during that rehearsal, we'd talk to Aaron and we'd fix that. Then we'd shoot it. If anything wasn't working, we'd talk to Aaron, get him up to the stage, and we'd fix it. We had uh, a one-minute commercial every show. It was called a cast commercial. Aaron wrote those. We gave them one hour. We gave the, uh, the client one hour. See, there, there again, part of the secret was that I, could, I was so close to Don Knotts that I could see his eyes turn into Barney Fife. We didn't fool around. We didn't ad-lib. We did all our ad-libbing before the camera rolled. And uh, we had everything rehearsed out. We knew when, when the last rehearsal should be because we were ready to shoot it right then. We usually got things in the first take. And that was true of uh, most of the other comedic characters, too. It, 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 we, we, we were each other's audience, even though he didn't necessarily laugh out loud. And they put a laugh track in, you know, to let the audience know it's supposed to be funny. We became friends in No Time for Sergeants, of course. And, uh, and we... Uh, we just immediately, uh, with the very beginning of the show, of the Annie Griffith show, we we worked hand in glove alike. It was just uh, our timing was alike. I could almost tell when Annie was going to 
come in and he could he said he could do the same with me and Andy found Barney funny I think that helped too I could see sometimes in Andy's eyes he was trying to keep from laughing <coughs> which would help me help me try to be even funnier and uh, and Andy was like the ultimate straight man. I mean, he was the the best you could imagine. I mean, he's just, he was his his sense of timing was incredible. And uh, and we just thoroughly enjoyed uh, that experience. So he allowed himself to be less funny. His character. Yeah. So that other he people. He pulled back. That let other people. Oh, he was fun. I think Andy had the time of his life on that show. Andy was very expressive and very, uh, he's, when Andy laughs, I mean, I mean, he'll hit, he'll hit them. His wife used to say to me, don't ever sit in front of Andy in a movie. <laughs> Something funny hits him, he'll hit you right on top of the head. Because that's the way he is, he'll hit the wall. I'd say something funny to Andy. Sometimes he'd run clear across the sound stage. <laughs> uh, he's just very demonstrative. Fun. He was fun to be around. I was the sheriff's son, growing up. Uh, you know, mother having passed away, but but you know, looking to Aunt B as as a, as a sort of a mother figure, but mostly leaning on um, my father, my pa. Early on, they wrote Opie a little differently. They m more like the typical sitcom kids who were always kind of with the wise, kind of the wise ass comebacks and jokes, punchlines, things like that. And um, I, later, I heard that my dad actually was talking to Andy about about it and the and the sort of the Andy Opie relationship. And Andy was talking to my dad about our relationship because my dad and I were very close, and my dad was around the set quite a bit in those days. And um, somehow, and my dad apparently said, "Well, what would happen if Opie knew that Andy was smarter than him? How, how about if how about if Opie actually respected his dad, as opposed to the sitcom kids who were always kind of making the dad look bad? I know there are jokes there with that, but I don't know. I just thought it might be different." I don't know if my dad was really thinking that, you know, he dreaded my getting into a pattern of thinking that those comebacks were the right way to deal with a parent uh, or not. I never asked him, but Andy really took to that, and that's how they begin, began to write that, that show and that relationship. And I, I think it was influenced a little bit by my own relationship with, with, with you know, my dad. It was a, a very um, simple, um, loving relationship. Uh, Opie did have a lot of respect for his father. He could act up and act out, um, and and you know, and once in a while, you know, you could do one of those moments where out of the mouth of babes comes the wisdom everyone needs. You know, I forgot that adage, but <laughs> but uh, uh, but uh, but you know, Opie could do that. Uh, but uh, for me, playing the part, it it was. Uh, Outside of the fact that there was a literal southern accent that I did, it you know it was it was really a matter of just being as as honest and realistic as I could be, and uh, I did learn a lot about comedy timing. And Andy was my primary teacher. Um, if I was stepping on a joke or needed to wait or something like that, and it, you know I'd I'd get I'd be schooled, and and generally Andy was the one who would do that, uh, and. Uh, uh, but, but for the most part, it was naturalism, and and that's and 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 it, and and the 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 Andy Opie relationship wasn't exactly like my dad's and mine, of course, and I could I could differentiate between the two, but it felt pretty similar. Uh, so it wasn't to me a kind of a fantasy world at all. It was, um, you know, it, it just was it was just simple, straightforward, um, kind of truthfulness. Andy Griffith, what was he like to work with? What was he like on the set? He was the boss of the show, for the most part, uh, and in a very good way. Excellent.
person, a nice person. Um, he has said since they didn't know how to write for me. I don't think that that's true. That's very kind of him to say. I don't think I did. I didn't give them anything to write for. But um, that was his excuse uh, for for that. Um, it was it was uh, Don Knotts and he that just clicked, and I don't think they ever felt that that was what was going to happen. And we'd sit around the table for the for the first reading, and um, and he would say, you know, why don't we give Ellie's line to Don and have Don say that? And so my lines kept taken away, taken away, taken away, but they worked. When Don said them, they were funny. When Don said them, they weren't funny. When I said them, I'm not funny, and um, uh, you know it. It just worked. It evolved. Don was wonderful to work with. Um, the world of comedy, the world has lost a, a great person when, when he passed away a few weeks ago. Um, dear, dear person. Betty Lynn is a is a very good friend of mine. Uh, we're very close, and uh, I loved Frances Bavier. She was. Uh, others have said she was tough and snappish and this and that, but I never found her so. I always found her very, very nice. And Ron Howard was the best child actor I had almost ever worked with. Up to that point, he was the best child actor I'd ever worked with. And um, not to take anything away from any other child actor that I have worked with since, he he just had something. He was. Not acting. He was. You were right. You were those people when you were talking to each other. It was. It was thrilling. Always knew his lines. Knew your lines as well. <laughs> and a nice little boy. Not the least bit bratty or know it all or anything. Just adorable. I love him. I credit his parents, uh, Rance Howard, who's who always has a nice cameo in any of Ron's movies. Is a wonderful character actor, and. He was all. He came with him more than the mother. The mother stayed home, who was also an actress, um, stayed home with Clint, the baby. Um, and Rance would come to the set with with Ron and taught him his lines. But they were wonderful parents. They kept Ronnie a little boy, and I don't. I, that's hard to do. Um, he was just a great child. You mentioned the, the Christmas episode. Did you sing with Andy on that episode? Mm -hmm. What was that like to, to perform with? It you? was scary, and I, I, I really didn't. I, I knew I had to do it, but I kind of didn't want to have to do it, you know. And uh, my mother said, well, "You know, I don't know why you're so afraid of it. You've sung that song a million times, and at Christmas and in church and everything else. You certainly know it, away in a manger, and." Uh, but I was terrified. I had this thing about not being able to sing, um, and so I, we went to the the recording studio after shooting during the day, and Andy Griffith was there, of course, with his guitar, and uh, our line producer was also there, and they had, you know, the um, all the microphones were all over the studio. And and he said, let's try and get a, a a key that we can both agree on here. So he kind of noodled around. He found a um, a key, and we started to rehearse. And my voice was shaking. And he said, you know, why don't we just sit down here on the floor? And there was a little riser. And we sat on the the edge of this riser. And he said, I'm just going to play some chords, and you hum. And when you feel really comfortable, just come in and we'll we'll start. He said, I'll just pick it up. So we did. He's doing, you know, just chords and I'm and I, so we started in away in a manger. And after we were finished with the song, uh, he said, Okay, I'll see you tomorrow morning. And I said, Well, aren't we gonna record it? And he said, We did. <laughs> We invented a lot of stuff on that show. We invented Gomer. We invented all the people who lived in the mountains, the Darling family, Ernest T. Bass. We invented all those characters. Tell us about where you got the idea for Gomer. Uh, Gomer. Well, uh, I was. Uh, we were going to do a show in which we introduced Wally, a new character, the, the mechanic. 
And they were very careful about hiring this actor who was going to be Wally. And then before, one day while we were working, I was on my way someplace and I got low on gas and I stopped for gas and this kind of simple-minded guy waited on me and uh, I said, I don't know what's going on here. It's, it says, uh, it says full, but it seems to be empty. And he said, well, sometimes you'll get an F when it's an E. And I this guy should be on the on the Griffith show. And uh, so when I went back, started working with Jim again, uh, we and, and Aaron, we suggested that we have a guy who works in the gas station uh, who was kind of simple-minded. And uh, we gave him a name. Gomer came from Gomer Cool, who was a comedy writer. And uh, Pyle came from Denver, who was an actor on the show. And uh, Andy had gone to a place called The Horn and seen Jim Neighbors do his act. And he thought he'd be good on the show. And uh, well, I had never seen Jim Neighbors. So when we wrote it, I used as a pattern, as a voice pattern, uh, pa Kettle. You remember Ma and Pa Kettle? Percy Kilbride. Mm -hmm. I don't make the rules, you know. A cow's got to have salt. Good news, Mr. Fuller. We struck mud. Well, that was the pattern that I used. And then in Jim Neighbor's mouth, it turned into something completely different, and it was very good. Different how? Well, he made a, a Jim Neighbor's character out of it. Uh, just his rhythms took these lines, and we never showed him how, how it sounded when we were writing it, and it fit. Did he audition for the part? Maybe he did. Uh, we weren't treated marvelously on that because uh, after a few weeks, uh, they decided without telling us that there would be a Jim Neighbors show, a Gomer Pyle show. And one day we were at one of our regular meetings and Jim Neighbors came in and said to me, is it going on or isn't it going on? I said, there's what going on? And that's how I found out that there was a Gomer Pyle show. Did the Writers Guild protect you on that? They had very t weak rules. We got uh, $200 each time it was on for six times. And other people became millionaires. At the end of each season, Sheldon would have a, a week of story conferences. And Sheldon, Aaron, myself, and anywhere from however many writers we could get in the room. But we always met in Sheldon's office. And we'd have uh, Jim and Ev, Harvey. We'd have uh, Jackie Ellenson and Chuck Stewart. Writers, you know and we would pitch stories. And uh, I was the one who, I, I caused more of them to go out than anybody. Uh, Sheldon didn't like that. We had the only fight Sheldon and I ever had in our, my whole acquaintanceship with him <coughs> was over a story idea. He wanted to introduce a character that I knew wasn't going to work. And it didn't. It was the mayor. He, they wanted me to have a boss figure. That's a good idea for the lead to have a boss figure. Like, like Lucy's boss figure was her, her husband. And uh, they wanted me to have a boss figure, and they say they wanted to introduce a mayor as a boss figure. And I told them before we started, that can't work because the mayor cannot be a boss to the sheriff. The sheriff's a county official. The mayor's just a little local town official. So it, de it didn't work. He stayed on for one season and just did infrequent appearances. But uh, that's the only fight Sheldon and I ever had. We never fought. We never had reason to fight. I wanted to keep the characters clean. If a, if a joke would make a lie out of a character, we'd throw the joke out. And that became very important. It became a basic rule. And, and uh, because of the nature of the show, morality just came right along with it. Like Opie the Birdman and, that Harvey wrote and uh, all those shows, uh, all those sweet shows. 
that they just came with the territory. I don't know how to describe Barney. He was a childlike uh, character. He thought he was a good cop. <laughs> thought he was the best cop in the world, I guess. And what was he like as a lawman? Apparently not too effective. <laughs> Did you use anything from the nervous character that you? No, nah, uh, occasionally when I wanted to, when he would have a reason to be frightened, I would I use a little of that. But I didn't like to work that into the character too much. Uh, and yet people used to say, oh, Barney's a little nervous guy, but it wasn't the same guy at all. Totally different character. Nippet was one of Barney's. Nippet, Nippet in the bud. Uh, he wanted somebody to shut up. I'm from West Virginia, so I had a little bit of hillbilly accent. We didn't lean on that. Andy. In the beginning, I think, laid on his southern dialect more than he really had, and then he, he pulled that way back as we went on. Originally, I think he was doing the character he did in uh, No Time for Sergeants. I think he was being the funny guy, and as he said later, he said, well, it turned out I wasn't the funny guy. It was Barney was the funny guy and the other characters. So he said my job was to play straight. So that's what he did. He, Pull the character way down, and just played him as a normal, normal guy. And and, that, and so he has a natural southern accent anyway. He didn't have to put any more on. I had I had uh, two guitars on the stage all the time. I had a five-string banjo on the stage all the time. And then Jim and Ev wrote that that wonderful group called the Darling Family, and we hired uh, some boys who had just come out of the Smoky Mountains called the Dillards. And the way we used them, we knew they couldn't, couldn't act. Wasn't room for that many people to talk anyhow. So we had them never speak. And Denver Pyle did all the talking for them. He was Briscoe Darling. He had a daughter named Charlene Darling, and she sang. She wasn't a hillbilly, but she fit right in. Music was always important to our show. Don and I sang a lot together, you know. Uh, I remember a show, uh, uh, Man in a Hurry was on a Sunday, and Don and I sat on the porch with my guitar and did the church in the Wildwood. And we would sing hymns in, in the jail, you know, just while we were dusting and sweeping and different things. Well, Ron was Opie, uh, Andy's son. He grew up on the show. When we started, I think, uh, Opie, uh, Ronnie was actually five years old. He hadn't turned six yet. Couldn't read yet. He was a nice little boy. And Ron was a natural actor. I, uh, to be as good as he was at the age of five was incredible. I couldn't believe it I saw him act. But he, could, he could do a tearful scene or a funny scene or whatever you gave him. He just instinctively knew how to do it. It was amazing. Can you talk about the relationship he had with Andy Griffith? Oh, they got along great. Yeah, and he and his dad would come every day and bring him. His dad, Rance Howard, was wonderful with with Ron. But Andy and he had a very good relationship. So you know, it's on Turner uh, twice a night, and uh, I watch it often. And I, I most of the time enjoy everything I see. Some I enjoy more than others. Ted Turner told me that, that, that the Griffith Show helped him start his network because he could afford it. See, and people watched it. They still watch it. We didn't know that when we started it that it was going to last that long or influence so many people. We were just trying to do a good show. But it has. It was uh, family oriented. It was about a little town and all the people who lived in it. And we had. As Bob Sweeney used to say, it looks like an ordinary little town, but it has a little border of insanity around it. And uh, all those fine comedic actors like Don Knotts and Howard McNear and Jim Neighbors and all of them uh, made it. They represented that little, that little uh, insane border uh, that was Mayberry. 
I left because Andy had said he would never do the show longer than five years. And, uh, and I had a five-year contract, and during the fifth season, I thought, geez, I better start looking around for more work. And I wound up getting a, an offer from Universal to do movies and do my own pictures. And then Andy suddenly said he was going to stay on another two or three years. Well, I, I, I'd already cast my lot, I guess. I hadn't really signed, but I had said I would, and I had, all, I had focused all my attention in that direction. And uh, I don't know, I just went ahead. But I, I was very, it was a tough time for me because I enjoyed the, the, the Griffith Show so much that I hated to leave. I never expected, uh, never expected it to go on. I had interviewed with a lot of people. I had, I had some offers. But, your, your money, your money. but movies, that's what I want. Oh. How conscious were you all about teaching moral lessons, the morality of the show? <clears throat> Uh, I don't think that we, any of us, ever overtly thought about that. Uh, I wanted to keep the characters clean. If a, if a joke would make a lie out of a character, we'd throw the joke out. And that became very important. It became a basic rule. And, and uh, because of the nature of the show, Morality just came right along with it. Like Opie the Birdman and, that Harvey wrote and uh, all of those shows, uh, all those sweet shows. That they just came with the territory. It was uh, family oriented. It was about a little town and all the people who lived in it. And we had, as Bob Sweeney used to say, it looks like an ordinary little town, but it has a little border of insanity around. And uh, all those fine comedic actors like Don Knotts and Howard McNear and Jim Neighbors and all of them uh, made it. They represented that little, that little uh, insane border uh, that was Mayberry. Oh, it changed enormously and the main change is when I was doing the Griffith Show, the network was only your host. The sponsor, see the sponsor bought that whole half hour. General Foods had that whole half hour. And we had only General Foods to answer to. We never had anything to answer to with the network. They came down once a year to say hello. We never had to answer to the sponsor either, really. Then, Prices got to where they sell by the seconds on network television. The network then gained control. When the network gained control, and they put all these children in these offices, it went all to hell then. It's, uh, it's, it's no more, uh, it's no more the, the uh, what, uh, Alice in Wonderland, or it's no more, it was so easy in the early days. It's just Sheldon and Aaron and me and Don. We didn't have to answer to anybody. Sheldon, Aaron said, yeah, we had to answer a little bit, but I never saw it. I never saw it, but now it's, it's all over, you know. Of course, on Matlock, I never heard anything either. We just, uh, we just pretty well pumped our scripts out, and I worked on the script like I did on The Griffith Show, like I have done on every show I've ever done. I worked on the script uh, weekends and during the day, and sometimes I'd write a whole scene during the day. When something was coming up and I didn't like what I saw, I'd write a new scene and shoot it. I, I usually like to check with Joel Steiger, was our head producer, and uh, I'm very fond of Joel, and I like to check with Joel, but sometimes the time was too short to do it. 